This talk was given by Roshi Rafe Martin, guiding teacher of the Endless Path Zendo, a lay Buddhist community in Rochester, New York. Join our practice, in person or online, at EndlessPathZendo.org. So, uh, today is Saturday, uh, March 16th. This is the first day of our two-day, um, entirely by Zoom, session. Uh, it's an interesting experiment, uh, and uh, sometimes, when necessary, a, a good one. So uh, I'm really glad we're able to hold this session, and uh, I hope uh, everything is working well for you at home as you zoom in. Uh, so today, uh, we'll uh, take up a koan in the gateless barrier. So let's set some context in place. The gateless barrier, which is in Chinese Wu Men Quan, we use gateless barrier uh, as English. Mu uh, Men Quan would be the Japanese. Uh, cases, commentaries, and verses by the Zen master Wu Men, uh, we mean Mu Men in Japanese, in 12th century China, is the koan collection we work with or on. After completing the first gate koans, uh, these first gate koans mean responding appropriately to Mu and its checking questions, the sound of a single hand, uh, one or two other brief koans, and a final question on Mu. Uh, then from there, uh, that would be the first gate, we move on to a series of 50, <coughs> excuse me, to 100 brief koans known as the miscellaneous preliminary or introductory koans which establish our ability to handle whatever types of koans uh, we meet with uh, when we uh, work on the gateless barrier, uh, and then the uh, Blue Cliff Record, and then the Book of Serenity, and then the Transmission of the Lamp. Our branch of Diamond Sangha koan tradition and Philip Kaplow lineage, it's a combined lineage, comes from Harada Roshi through Yasutani Roshi, to Kapla Roshi, to Dane and Henry Roshi, to us, as well as through Yasutani Roshi, to Yamada Roshi, to Aiken Roshi, once again to Dane and Henry Roshi, and then once more through him to us. So we are a conjoined hybrid lineage. Our koan practice is pretty much in Diamond Sangha tradition as established by Aiken Roshi, but Given Dane and, uh, and my own background, we also make use of elements of Kaplow koan expression as well. In the Zendo itself, our atmosphere and style are a hybrid of Diamond Sangha and Kaplow Roshi styles. Kaplow Roshi's dedication to the Dharma, his love of myth and story, and particularly the heartfelt closeness, personal warmth, and lasting friendship he shared with Rose and myself are embodied in this endo. Of course, koans are not required practice. We all start with counting the breath and experiencing the breath, and for some people, that, uh, that continues uh, to remain their practice. Even if we go on to koan practice, breath practice underlies it. Additionally, some may choose to take up an inquiry, like who is hearing, and others, uh, as I've said, continue with some form of breath practice. Both Diamond Sangha and Kaplow lineages stepping, stemming as they do from Harada Sogaku Roshi and Yasutani Roshi are themselves hybrid, a best of the best of both worlds lineages, drawing on both Soto and Rinzai traditions. Harada Roshi, a Soto priest, went to the Rinzai teacher Dokton Roshi to take up and complete koan practice under him. Why? Well, recently I learned uh, from uh, something from my uh, Dharma sister, Mitra Bishop Roshi, something she said in an interview with Rick McDaniel, who's done a series of books interviewing uh, contemporaries and teachers, that early in the, uh, early in the 20th century, uh, the large Soto institutions, they had many, many temples, needed priests. And if I have her, what she said correctly, uh, she said that uh, in order to fill the temples, said they'd have leadership there, they removed Kensho as a requirement uh, 
for being a teacher. And uh, this moved Harada Roshi to take up koan practice with a Rinzai teacher uh, because he felt uh, the issue of uh, Kensho, of uh, actual realization was being, had become treated in a very vague way uh, in the Soto tradition of the time. Westerners uh, can be surprised to learn that the lineage that resulted from him as a Soto priest doing Rinzai koan practice was a rather small and peripher peripheral uh, lineage in Japan. As a hybrid of Rinzai and Soto, it did not fit into Japanese categories of purity and sectarian loyalty. Interestingly, however, what he and his disciple Yasutani Roshi, a married Soto priest with family, created has become the backbone of Western koan practice. So, as a best of both Soto and Rinzai, as well as of Aitken and Kaplow lines, we continue a lineal hybrid tradition. I recommend reading The Three Pillars of Zen by Philip Kaplow Roshi, as well as Aitken Roshi's Taking the Path of Zen, if you want to see how our direct Dharma forebears actually taught. Today's koan is case 28 in The Gateless Barrier. Lung Dan blows out a candle. Uh, that name would be Ryutan in Japanese. It means dragon pond. Uh, though we might call it Deshan or Toksan, Japanese would be Toksan, carries his pack, as I see it as the first part of a three part koan trilogy consisting of Deshan carries his pack, Deshan carries his bundle, and Deshan carries his bowls. So for today, the first day of our two-day March 2024 session, the koan is as follows. Deshan went to Lung Tan and questioned him sincerely far into the night. It grew late and Lung Tan said, you'd better retire. Deshan made his bows and lifted the blinds to withdraw, but was met by darkness. Turning back, he said, it's dark outside. Lung Tan lit a candle and handed it to him. As Deshan was about to take it, Lung Tan blew it out. At this, Deshan had sudden realization, realization and made obeisance. What truth did you discern? asked Lung Tan. Deshan replied, from now on, I will not doubt the words of any of the great Zen masters in the world. The next day, Lung Tan took the high seat before his assembly and declared, Among you monks, there is a brave fellow whose fangs are like swords and whose mouth is like a bowl of blood. Strike him with a stick and he won't turn his head to look at you. One day he will climb the highest peak and establish his way there. Deshan brought his notes and commentaries on the Diamond Sutra before the Dharma Hall and held up a torch saying, even though one masters all the profound teachings, it is like placing a single hair in vast space. Even though you have learned all the secrets of the world, it is like throwing a drop of water into a deep ravine. And he burned up all his notes. Then making his bows, he took leave of his teacher. What do you think Deshaun means when in response to Lung Tan's query about what he'd realized, he says, from now on, I will not doubt the words of any of the great Zen masters in the world. To fully understand this lengthy case, we need to look at Wu Men's commentary, which according to the unwritten logic of storytelling should have come first because it presents the backstory. Here's Wu Men's commentary. Before Deshan had left home, his mind was indignant and his tongue sharp. Full of arrogance, he went south to exterminate the doctrine of the special transmission outside the sutras. When he reached the road to Li Zhou, he sought to buy refreshments from an old woman at a roadside tea stand. The old woman said, Venerable monk, what are all those books you're carrying on your back? Deshan said, 
They are my notes and commentaries on the Diamond Sutra. The old woman said, I hear the Diamond Sutra says, past mind cannot be grasped, present mind cannot be grasped, future mind cannot be grasped. Which mind does your reference intend to refresh? Deshan was dumbfounded and could not answer. Unable to die the great death under the old woman's words, he asked, Is there a Zen master nearby? The old woman said, Master Lung Tan lives about half a mile from here. Arriving at Lung Tan's monastery, Deshan was utterly defeated. His earlier words simply, uh, certainly did not match his later ones. As for Lung Tan, he seemed to have lost all sense of shame in his compassion for his son. Finding a bit of live coal in the other, he took up muddy water and drenched him, destroying everything at once. Looking at the matter calmly, you can see it was all a farce. <clears throat> now remember, uh, Teisho is not a lecture. Uh, we do Zazen, and we practice with the Teisho. So we allow the Teisho in, like uh, the sound of wind in the trees. We don't sit and mull over it. We don't think of it as a lecture. Now we sit back and relax. No, we practice with the Teisho and see what it'll do. Find out what it'll do by working on your practice. So the general instructions are to think of a Teisho as being spoken to you alone. It's not a group activity. And secondly, um, if you're working on a koan, continue to work on the koan and just allow the Teisho the way you'd allow any of the sounds around you. If you're uh, counting breath, then just be one with the listening. And if you should find listening and working on a koan at the same time too complex, then let listening take precedence. So now some backstory to the backstory. Deshan was a noted scholar of the Diamond Sutra, dedicated to the traditional Buddhist teaching of gradual enlightenment. In essence, this meant study of the sutras and Vinaya or moral ethical teachings, the ongoing practice of the ten paramitas or perfections, generosity, morality, patient forbearance, zeal or vigor, focused meditation, that would be jhana or zazen, wisdom, prajna, skillful means, resolve, spiritual power, and knowledge, or jnana. Upholding then also the 16 bodhisattva precepts, which we take in Jukai, all of which may be summed up in the Buddha's eightfold path of right view, right resolve, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right meditative awareness. Uh, <clears throat> this path is upheld over lifetimes traditionally and ultimately leads through the 10 stages of bodhisattva activity and brings the practitioner in the long, long run to Buddhahood. The Jataka tales, past life tales of the Buddha's human, animal, spirit, God, tree, are part of the canonical Buddhist view demonstrating the endless work involved in negotiating and fulfilling this path. It is not a path discounted by Zen, but there is another road. Zen says another road that's a way to awake the Buddha mind right now, just as we are. And this is the path that Zen offers and wants us to uncover. It is a teaching beyond words and letters, a direct pointing to mind itself as Bodhidharma, first patriarch of Zen or ancestor of Zen in China clearly said. It is where Zen takes its stand, not in belief, but in the experience of this, the living fact of our own nature right now. It was not created by Zen Buddhism, but expresses the Buddha's own astonishingly fundamental and profound insight, that wonder of wonders, 
all beings are already Buddhas, fully endowed with wisdom and virtue. Only their dualistic preoccupation with habitual self-centeredness prevents their realization of this. In other words, Deshan, as an upholder of academic sutra study and of a many-staged, ongoing bodhisattva path, was a classical Buddhist, a gradualist. He did not believe in the thing called Zen <coughs> that was flourishing in the south of China. And yet, that's where the sixth patriarch was, and that's where Zen was really taking off. And yet, as he lived in 9th century Tang era China, the so-called golden age of Zen, that was exactly when things were hopping in the area of enlightenment and Zen teaching, back down in the south where the Sixth Patriarch had been. Uh, interestingly, of course, the Sixth Patriarch is, by Zen tradition, said to have been illiterate. So what could texts and books have meant to him? Of course, modern scholarship cast some doubt on this, but it still makes a very good point. Uh, enlightenment does not need book learning to strike. Now, Taishan himself was not only learned, but of fierce character, something of a hothead, volatile, ferociously self-confident, aggressively certain of his own views. He would brook no deviation from what he, by dint of hard work, thought, intelligence, and practice, had come to understand as the truth. Naturally, when he heard that Zen, this thing called Zen, taught a special transmission, not dependent on sutras, but by pointing directly to mind itself, can enable anyone, anyone, to realize their original nature and awake to Buddhahood, he was incensed. Spluttering with indignation, he took it upon himself as a noted authority, so expert on the Diamond Sutra that his nickname was Diamond Zhu, Z-H-A-O-U, Zhu, or like Diamond Joe or Diamond Charlie, to head south and rout out this lying, thieving nest of Zen blasphemers who, as followers of the Sixth Patriarch, taught that sudden realization of enlightenment was possible for all without going through countless progressive lifetimes and stages. And indeed, of course, as we said about the Sixth Patriarch, it said that as he was an illiterate woodcutter who happened to hear a portion of the Diamond Sutra being recited or chanted, and, and, and because of that, suddenly awoke with no study at all. Anyway, Deshan wasn't having it. Hitching a box with his Diamond Sutra commentaries on his back, he marched off down south to give them what for. On he marched, one foot after the other, that heavy box roped onto his back. After hundreds of miles, he came to a roadside stand near his goal, where an old woman was selling tea and tea cakes or buns. Tea cakes were known colloquially in China then as mind refreshers. So, wiping his brow and setting down his heavy pack, he asked for tea and some mind refreshers to refresh himself. The old woman was one of those Zen grannies, a wise old woman, who in less patriarchal times might have been running a monastery and guiding students herself. Instead, here she was, selling tea and mind refreshers, watching alert and hawk-eyed for monks whose understanding and practice she might encourage. This particular old tea-selling woman looked at Deshan and saw she'd found a live one. So innocently, she asked, what was it he was carrying on that heavy pack on his back that he just set down? Well, Deshan could hardly deign to speak of such lofty matters with an old tea-selling woman, but finally he said, and probably somewhat loftily, in here, my good woman, are my noted commentaries on the Diamond Sutra. Ah, she said, perhaps as if awed, 
imagine that. Please tell me, venerable sir, as I, an old ignorant woman, I've heard that the Diamond Sutra says, oh, what was it? Oh, uh, oh, past mind cannot be grasped. Present mind cannot be grasped. Future mind cannot be grasped. If, if that's so, venerable sir, which mind will you refresh with these cakes and tea? If you can tell me, I'll give you my mind refreshers for free. But if you can't, you won't get any. Not for any amount. Diamond Zhu was stunned. How would you respond? How would you answer the old woman? Can you? He couldn't. Pierced through by an old woman, he found he'd reached the end of his knowledge. In the reality of this live exchange, his wonderful notes were already useless, as if burnt to a crisp. Yet here is where his fundamental character shows. Broken, stunned, shamed, he does not strike out, does not get huffy, does not become enraged or put on airs. He does not make excuses and say, you're just an old woman. What the hell do you know? He knows he's been bested and he owns up to it. Rising like a hungry fish to the bait that this skillful old granny has lowered before his blood bowl of a mouth. Humbly, in humility and darkness, he asks, is there a Zen master nearby? There is, she answers, just keep going down this road about half a mile and you'll come to the Dragon Pond Monastery and maybe you'll meet the dragon himself. So as I've mentioned, Ryutan or Lungtan means dragon pond. Teachers in old China, often took the name of the mountains their monasteries were located on or other natural features of the environment as their own name. They were not separate from the environment or place or home ground. Intimacy was their whole nature. So the great, the great scholar Deshan, stripped of pride in his bright and shining certainty, picks up his path and trudges on down the road where in time, he will fall into the dragon pound, uh, dragon pond, and uh, and drown. He'll fall into the dragon pond and and drown. But in fact, once he gets there, he's caught his breath, and when some fight in him shows a spark, a text that Shibuyama Roshi references in his book Zen Comments on the Mumen Khan relates that when Taishan arrived, he said. I've come to the renowned dragon pond, but I see neither dragon nor pond. He seems to be taking a stand in scholarship again, stating intellectually that all is empty as the Diamond Sutra teaches. I see nothing at all. Or maybe he sees the old abbot, Lung Don, standing there, nothing dragon-like about him, hardly an imposing figure, certainly nothing fearsome. What's all the fuss about Zen teachers? I see nothing. But Lung Tan responds, that's right. You yourself have arrived. In short, this is the dragon pond where dragons lurk and dragons get made. But do you even understand what you're saying? Uh, Lung Tan was an interesting character. Um, <clears throat> he was actually himself a noted teacher uh, and uh, there's a lot we could say about him, but all we really need to know is that he was a teacher of some real standing. Um, it came from a very poor uh, childhood. Uh, financially, his parents were among the poor. Uh, and uh, he, he, there's an interesting anecdote about him uh, as a teacher. I don't remember all of it, um, but he, he, at one point, someone who had been with him for quite a while um, said something, a kind of complaint about, well, I've been with you so long and I expected some teaching, uh, but I haven't received any teaching. And Lung Tan uh, responded saying something like, um, uh, when you uh, called my name, did I not answer? 
when you uh, gave me my tea, did I not uh, drink it? Uh, and so on. He, he made a little list of things like that. He said, when was I not uh, teaching? Very uh, humble, very present. In any case, after their initial uh, meeting, uh, Deshan defen Deshan's defenses seem to have come down, and he and Lung Tan end up talking late into the night. This is where the koan itself, the case, uh, comes into its own. As they do, gradually and quietly, Deshan certainties, all his very fixed beliefs, his practiced arguments, his stunning refutations, all the things that he was known for fade into the darkness. Then uh, when he's really in, in pitch dark, when he is going to head out and he goes, oh, it's dark out there. Lung Don shows his brilliance, hands him a candle, and then as Deshan reaches to take it, blows it out. The last tiny bit of light is gone. The Prajna Paramitas is gone, gone, entirely gone. The word Nirvana, you remember, means just that, blown out like a candle in the wind. All self-centeredness, all greed, anger, ignorance, entirely gone. This is the great death. And with that wonderful failure, Deshan's Dharma candle is lit. With this sudden deep realization, he's awake to what had only been theory. He's awakened to what is eternal, vast, empty of all limiting self-centeredness, selfless and pure. This is a true conversion experience to exactly what he'd originally so fervently disbelieved. Enlightenment now. Instead of belief, he now knows he has arrived at the dragon pond indeed and fallen in for he finds that there really is a teaching beyond all words and letters by which we can awake to what and where we already truly are he gets zen and in that instant moves from classical buddhism buddhism's belief in the buddha to personal experience of buddha He's not Shakyamuni Buddha, he's Deshan, arrived indeed and touched base with mind, with the true nature of trees, stars, animals, rivers, children, bugs, Shakyamuni, you and me. No doubt remains. Do you see Lung Tan's genius? He teaches Deshan without reliance on words or letters, the very thing Deshan had held to be impossible. And he does so not by ignoring words and letters or trying to evade them, but by going so fully into them that words are exhausted. It's dark out there, indeed. And then whoosh, blown out. The Diamond Sutra emphasizes emptiness. Emptiness. Deshan had that view intellectually down pat. He knew the concept, but Lung Tan creates a circumstance, a context, in which Deshan actually experiences it. Deshan's mind is empty. There's nothing left empty. It's dark out there is exactly right. Lung Don hears him and reads it exactly right. What a request. Give me some light. Isn't this what we're all asking of books, teachers, traditions? It's dark out there. Please give me a little light. Isn't this why we practice? Deshan's mind, emptied of all concepts, all learning, all pride, all sureness is so very ripe. Lung Tan helped create the context for realization, but he can't give anything to Deshan. Instead, he skillfully, skillfully takes away at just the right time the last thing 
Deshaun holds to. Whoosh! Gone. Darkness, of course, is itself the source of light. Countless galaxies, billions of stars emerge out of vast and empty darkness. Even now, though, with this experience, Deshaun is quite himself, still an extremist, like a pendulum. First he swings one way, now he swings the other. In his newfound vast empty joy, he burns his beloved sutra and his cherished commentaries, again demonstrating his essential ferocity. What had before been for him totally right is now totally wrong. Now for him, not even the most profound teachings, even the most inexpressibly lofty thoughts, they can't even begin to compare with the reality of his own mind, our mind, yours and mind. He's got it all right. Listen, he says, even though one masters all the profound teachings, it's like placing a single hair in vast space. Even though you learn, you've learned all the secrets of the world, it's like throwing a drop of water into a deep ravine. And then he burns all his notes, makes his vows, and leaves. These are deeply moving words. But what a hothead he clearly still is. Lung Tan sees him clearly, because here's what he says at the end. Among you, among you monks, there's a brave fellow with fangs like swords and a mouth like a bowl of blood. Strike him with a stick, and he won't turn his head to look at you. One day he will climb the highest peak and establish his way there. One day. The point is clear enough. This joy and freedom is what Zen offers each of us, not just to learn about Buddhism and study texts, but to our own degree realize the way. Showing up, waking up, growing up. These are our current three pillars of Zen. Deshan, ferocious, confident and strong as he is, still has a lot of growing up to do, as do we all. Even the fully realized Buddha Shakyamuni himself is said to be only halfway there, which is a traditional way of revealing the true endlessness of our endless path. Why burn sutras? Reading and study can be, are deeply important. Would Deshaun have even arrived at his insight without a foundation of many years of exactly reading and study? Roshi Kaplow liked to repeat the old Zen saying, the ancient teachings illumine the mind and the mind illumines the ancient teachings. The ancient, ancient teachings illumine the mind and the mind illumines the ancient teachings. It's quite reciprocal. The teachings bring us alive and we bring the teachings alive. Even so rigorous and demanding a teacher as Hakuin insisted that reading and study were crucial, if anything, even more after awakening than before. Yet Deshan, floored by what his realization has revealed, destroys his wonderful sutra commentaries it's a beautiful moment, revealing the depths of what's occurred for and to him. It also reveals his integrity and commitment. And yet, might the koan here not also be calling him to task? It's like he's kind of drunk, but on a kind of very high quality wine. He seems to have all the answers at last. But is that enough? What's missing? In working on this koan with the teacher, a student is called on to actualize that essential mind. Realize the mind of Deshan and Lungtan, enter the dragon pond and arrive, not just intellectually like Deshan did early on, but really drop the pack we've been lugging around Shed everything and find the living fact. 
for starts. Maturing, as the koan suggests, means continuing on from even a profound, even overwhelming insight on and on. Maybe one day we sit down and somewhat chagrined to recall our earlier impetuousness, rewrite those notes we had so precipitously burned. They may come in handy now that we actually have some sense of what those commentaries were talking about, if we mean to share a life of practice with others. Working on koans is one way our tradition offers to help us burn up what, do, uh, what Bob Dylan in uh, Tombstone Blues calls our pointless, useless knowledge. The weight of all that stuff we carry around like Deshaun lugging that pack of commentaries the stuff that we carry around that cuts us off from intimacy with sun, moon, stars, rain, wind, sickness, health, children, partners, squirrels, stars. Let's be clear. There's nothing wrong with knowledge. Janana is the final, the tenth paramita or perfection. The perfection of knowledge. Knowledge of what? Zen is not anti-knowledge. The masters of old, including the supposedly illiterate Sixth Patriarch, were all learned men and women. Deshan dramatically burning his notes is full of sound and fury. Still, his glorious unfettered joy, joy in realizing just what all those notes have been pointing to all along, that he's finally got what the notes we're talking about should make us sit up and take notice just when our own burden seems heaviest zen can help us step into the darkness and as a final gift blow out our candle what more could we ask for so we'll stop here oh, oh i'm sorry wait a minute there's a little bit more i forgot there's a verse so uh woman concludes after uh after this uh with a brief verse that explores a metaphor of physiognomy woman writes seeing the face is better than hearing the name hearing the name is better than seeing the face he saved his nose, but alas, he lost his eyes. Seeing the face is better than hearing the name. Hearing the name is better than seeing the face. He saved his nose, but alas, he lost his eyes. So, what is seeing the face and why is it better than hearing the name? But then why might hearing the name be better than hearing than seeing the face. And then Mu, Wu Men moves further into the metaphor to talk about Deshan saving his nose. What's he getting at? And then after all this, and it has been quite a journey, Wu Men brings us to a final point. Je, Deshan has lost a lot. His notes, his commentaries, his fixed beliefs, all his certainties. But what's this now about losing his eyes? A face with a nose but no eyes seems horrible or maybe simply pitiful. Maybe burning those notes was foolish after all. Maybe he's got nothing to guide himself with anymore. Is this why woman adds, alas? Or is he talking about darkness and not being able to see? He lost his eyes. Remember, it's, it's dark out there. Or is he going even further? Aitken Roshi sums up his Taisho on this in his book, Gateless Barrier, which is his translations and commentaries on all the cases, uh, commentaries and verses of the Gateless Barrier with a last line. And this is how Aitken Roshi sums up the verse. He became totally blind at last. Now, we'll stop here and recite our great vows for all.